called to work and out in the field trying to be a soul winner. How many of you have memorized Proverbs 11.30? Well, I had hoped that everybody would, and some have. I praise the Lord for it. Proverbs 11.30, would you state it with me together, please? And remember, now don't slouch around the Word of God, and don't do it half-heartedly. Don't be um, monotone in this thing. This is God's holy Word. Would you state it with me, please? Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Well, we have that as our text verse, and I hope you remember it. Then I had given you some verses to please consider memorizing. You need a bunch of verses in your mind ready to go because you don't know exactly which direction your conversation may go when you're talking to somebody, either at the altar or the inquiry room, as we use here, and uh, either at the inquiry room or out in the field. And you'll remember, please, that I had given you uh, Romans 3.23 and 6.23 and 10, 9, 10, and 13, uh, commonly referred to as the Roman road to salvation. And of course, I'm sure that many of you can quote those verses already. I had also given you John 3.16 through 18. Now, most people know John 3.16 very well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Verse number 17 is a good one because it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. I, th I think that is a good verse to show us the purpose of God in bringing Jesus Christ into the world. And then verse number 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. And then I also added John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And John 5.24 where again Jesus was saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. I also gave you Romans 5, 6 through 8. How many of you remember what Romans 5, 6 through 8 says? And the hands go up by the thousands, or stay down by the thousands, maybe it'd be a better way of putting it. Uh, Romans uh, 5, 6 through 8 is that one, for when we were yet without strength, just means we couldn't save ourselves. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And then it goes on to say, uh, for scarcely for a righteous man would one dare to die, Perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I did not quote that word for word, but that's the gist of those three verses right there. And they're good verses to have in mind. And then I want to stress Revelation 3.20. Because, uh, boy, uh, to me that's one verse, if you were to give explanation of everything in there, you could bring a soul to Christ. The Lord said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Now, while there are many who say that that is Christ standing at the door of the church trying to get in, uh, whereas that may make a good application, I believe that hermeneutically that verse is speaking to the individual. And remember, folks, inevitably it's going to come down to the individual automatically. And the verse does say, if any man, uh, obviously referring to woman or boy or girl likewise, hear my voice and open the door. I will come in and sup with him and he with me. 
And uh, don't you see there the consideration of John chapter number 1, verses 11 and 12, for he came into his own and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, received him, received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Uh, to me, Revelation 3.20 is very much kindred to that. He that heareth my voice, he that believeth, 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 and openeth the door, as many as received me. He that receiveth the Son, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I like Revelation 3.20 very, very much. I want to add a couple of verses today uh, to you. And by the way, I had given you uh, John 1, 11 and 12 and 13 as well, which were born. Uh, you need to take those verses in the light of John chapter number 3, especially where we have being born again. Do you remember? Uh, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, who came to Jesus by night. And uh, <clears throat> Jesus told him that except a man be born again, he could not see the kingdom of God. And then again, he said, except a man be born of, the, of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And I try to submit to people that that being born of water is not baptism. Uh, it is the flesh birth. Uh, it is being born of, of the flesh, uh, as many of you are familiar with how a little baby is born and the uh, different wonders that take place there. And to show that that's what that means, you can just read the next verse where Jesus explained what he meant in verse number 5 there. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Uh, I like John 1 and verse number 13 in that regard uh, because as many as received him, verse 12 says, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Then what does verse 13 say? Which were born. Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Uh, those verses, uh, to me, have a thread in them, and I think it's good to have those verses in your mind. Uh, memorized, I believe, is important. And you say, well, Brother Burkholder, I, I just can't memorize. Well, uh, you can. Uh, if you put s some work into it. Uh, when I try to memorize a scripture, I, I have to take a little time with it. I mean, I, I don't have a photographic memory. I can't read it one time and have it down. I have to take a little time with it. And I usually take it a phrase at a time and then see if I can go over it. And then I look at it again to see if I went over it right. And then maybe I do that in the morning. Then I have to do that again, say, in the afternoon or at night. Uh, and I may have to do that for a few days in order to get it down. But you'll get it. You'll get it. Try it. Uh, take off with something easy uh, if you need to. And of course, the memorization of whole chapters of the Bible is a very good thing too. And when I talk about the need of memorizing scriptures, I hope that all of you are remembering the classic in the Old Testament of uh, David, I believe Psalm 119, uh, when he said in verse number 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. And so I believe that we have a basis there for memorizing the word of God, as well as several other verses in the Bible. And of course, these verses are good to have down because of being able to have them at your fingertips to talk to somebody, to lead somebody to Jesus Christ, uh, either in the inquiry room, at the altar, uh, wherever, out under the oak tree, as far as that goes, out in the field, whatever the case may be. Now, today I would like to add a few scriptures more uh, for you to memorize. And 
I think to myself, now that they've got all of those other scriptures memorized, let's go for another one. Oh, let me tell you this about memorizing scripture. You can't memorize it just to be able to say it one time. you got to keep going over it and over it on a daily basis for a while, and then on a weekly basis for a while, and then on a monthly basis for a while, and then every three months for a while. And uh, uh, it's good to write down, keep on your computer or, or your um, iPhone or whatever you have. If you got an old phone like I've got, you can't do it. But uh, keep the list of verses you memorize uh, so that you can go to that and go over those verses very carefully. I do not on my computer have the verses written out, but I do have the references. And there's a reason for that. I want to be able to look at the reference and quote the verse in my mind. Now, on the other hand, it's good for me to hear a verse and know where it's found. So that's a two-way street there on memorization. And I hope that you'll consider that. Oh yes, back to the adding of a scripture today. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Did I see Sarah's mouth, mouth 3 and 4 already? I thought I saw that, Sarah. She's probably got it memorized. That's the Apostle Paul giving the definition of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And after all, when somebody comes to Christ, are we not going to have to have the gospel? Now, there you can see in verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, uh, about the Apostle Paul talking concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ in that resurrection chapter of the Bible. And in verses 3 and 4, what, he, what does he say? But I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Uh, kind of in the vein, brothers and sisters, that the most important thing is the first thing. Uh, and Paul needed to get the business down of salvation, of being born again, of really knowing Christ as Savior. It's kind of like this. You're not going to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ until you're born again into the family of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so he said, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. You might want to cross-reference that with John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Or Revelation 3.20, He that heareth my voice and openeth the door, I will come into him and sup with him, and he with me. Now there the Apostle Paul said, But I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now those are classic verses that I, I think everyone who is saved needs to have down in their heart because they're a simple definition, a short, concise definition of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you can see that by putting those two verses with verse number one of that chapter. Now, last week, you may recall, please, that I had given you those verses, and we reviewed that first simple set up of giving the gospel from the Roman road and then I was going to review the different trouble spots in talking to somebody about the Lord which we did and I gave you a third one and that third one was getting started do you remember and do you remember that I said often asking questions is a good thing to do because it's going to engage the person you're talking to, I think, in a more personal way. And as I was telling you last week, I had gotten those from C.S. Lovett out in California. But here, 
Uh, in the getting started, it is good to ask uh, a person a question, I think. Uh, and the first one that C.S. Lovett gave was, Are you interested in spiritual things? And no matter what they say, you can go on to the next question. And uh, the order of these questions may be reversed, but... Uh, whatever you have if someone were to ask you what a Christian is what would you say and then remember the next question I gave you was the loaded one have you ever thought about becoming a Christian I say that's loaded because that puts some kind of an act of the will upon the person that you're talking to too many people think they're automatically Christians because they had never done anything really bad. I mean, I'm not like Charles Manson and the Sharon Tate mission, which I guess a lot of you guys probably don't even know what that is, uh, do you? But that gang probably went through Barstow on their way to the Bay Area um, when I was pastoring out in Barstow. So I remember... And now you're saying, oh, that's why I don't know the name. Well, the Burkholder is so old, that's ancient history to me. Well, be that as it may, a lot of people think, I'm not as bad as you can put in there whatever you want to. But ultimately, a person has to come to grips with their relationship with Christ, and they have to do something to get saved. Now, I know that the work has already been done. Jesus died for everybody, did he not? His shed blood, death, burial, and resurrection at Calvary was sufficient for this, the entire population of all the ages. But it is only efficient for those who receive him as their personal Lord and Savior is a good way to put it. I think that the question, have you ever thought about becoming a Christian, is a good one. Now, here is a, another question that I sometimes ask a person. And again, I want to remind you what I said. Every situation is different. Now, you can read all the soul-winning books you want to read, but the guy you're talking to hasn't read that book. And he doesn't know he's supposed to say such and such when you say such and such. So you've got to have a bunch of scriptures ready to go. And consequently, another question that I sometimes like to ask a person is, uh, where do you think you'll spend eternity? I might ask that question in several different ways. The person may have already told me they don't believe in God. And I might say, well say, if there were a heaven and there were a hell, where do you think you would go? And I've had people jokingly say, oh, well, go, go to hell. It's not a joking matter. Of course, you can't tell them that. But you can ask that question, hopefully, to start their wheels turning in some way. Now, in the turning of those wheels, what is the most important thing that is going to count out of what you've got to say to them? The what? The Word of God, right? Why? Because Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I've thought of that verse a lot of times and thought to myself, sharper than my arguments, sharper than my questions, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And they may laugh on the outside, but never you mind, on the inside it becomes a different matter altogether. Uh, Marshall will remember, as I've told before about the boy uh, when I was first out of uh, college, and uh, I had talked to him about the Lord, and he was polite and listened to me while I was talking to him. He, he was very well-mannered, but later on, 
he had a really good time of joking and laughing and cutting up about, yeah, that old David Burkholder came over to witness to me. <laughs> so he, yeah, you remember the guy I'm talking about, Marsh. But he got saved. I think, was it at youth camp? Or, uh, the winter retreat. We, we nearly met our Waterloo on that winter retreat up in Colorado uh, that year. But boy, the Lord gave us a tremendous youth camp. I, I'll never forget that one. And uh, he gave a testimony in church after he got saved. And I didn't know it. None of his friends ever told me. I didn't know it until he gave that uh, testimony that night at camp. I uh, happened to be sitting on the platform and he turned around and, and he said uh, he didn't know if I knew or not but he would make jokes and laugh at me for having witnessed to him. He said, I don't know if you've heard that or not, but he, he said I was laughing on the outside but on the inside, I was under conviction. He didn't use that word, but that's what he meant. And indeed, out of anything you can do, brothers and sisters, the most important thing is to keep in mind the Word of God. Now, in leading a person to Christ, as I say, I've given you that business of uh, the Roman road. It's a simple one. Now, uh, here is another one. And we want to, number one, establish the fact that the person is a sinner. So use Romans 3.23. There are a lot of kindred verses that show that, that I'll get to perhaps in a moment. I doubt we're going to have the time. I will next week, perhaps. But you want to establish that the person is a sinner. Step number one, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you want to establish the... the, the Wages of sin is death. Step number two, Romans 6.23. And then you can always say, but. The last part of that verse says, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And from there, go to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Because you're going to have to establish the gospel. You can establish that a person is a sinner and you can establish that there is a hell. But in order to get out of going to hell, you have to establish the gospel. So verse number... Or, or the third step is to do just exactly that. Establish the gospel. And does not John 3.16 give us in the nutshell the gospel? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then step number four is to show John 1, 11 and 12. He came into His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, excuse me, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Why do I keep going back to that verse? Because as was said Sunday morning in the adult Sunday school class, the devils believe and tremble. But they're not going to heaven. I heard a message one time on three classes of people with no hope. The first class happened to be the atheist. The second class happened to be that class of people who believe in God or have a false God. They believe in some kind of God. And the third class was the people who believe in Jesus Christ as the true God but never receive Him personally as their Savior. It is important to understand that Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. But folks, we have to have an act of our own will come to Jesus Christ as Savior ourselves. And so we have 
what I like in John 1, 11 and 12. And with that, I correlate Revelation 3.20. I will tell you this little true incident. And uh, then um, close out with another illustration. But uh, my sister Bonnie, while she was still in high school... Uh, dealt at the altar with one of my nephews who now uh, is older and in ill health. Uh, obviously he's not as old as I am, but he's not in nearly as good a health as I am. He's had some real problems. He came to the altar at my dad's church up in Denver when he was just a youngster. And uh, my sister Bonnie, who was in high school at the time, dealt with him at the altar. And I want to say this, again, even you young people, you guys need to know how to lead a person to Jesus Christ as, your, as their Savior. And my sister Bonnie dealt with him at the young people. And uh, you'd have to know my nephew in order to appreciate this, really. Uh, but she talked to him about sin and the Lord dying on the cross and, and um, rising again and being the Savior. And uh, Would you like to pray and ask Jesus into your heart? And um, my nephew uh, said, I can't get it, Aunt Bonnie, I can't get it. That's a quote. And so she went through it again. And got down to ask him, would, would you like to pray with me here and receive it? He said, I can't get it, Aunt Bonnie. I can't get it. And Bonnie uh, told me later that she was praying while this was going on. Lord, please help me to know what to do that I can help him to understand. And she said, um, there was a piece of paper in, in the inquiry room and she took him from John 1, 11 and 12 and John 3, 16 to Revelation 3:20. And out of that piece of paper, she tore a paper heart. She didn't have any scissors with her. So she tore a paper heart out of there. And, and she tore in the middle of that uh, kind of place for a door. And she told him, she said, Steve, uh, it's my cousin, my nephew Steve out in California. She said, um, Steve, this is kind of like our heart. Not our real heart, but our real us. And see, there, according to the Bible, it's like a door to your heart. And, and you're kind of cracking the door a little bit. Because he came forward to be saved. But he needs to understand too, right? And she said, you're kind of cracking the door a little bit. She said, Steve, you need to open the door all the way up. She did that with a torn piece of paper. And he said, I get it, Aunt Bonnie, I get it. And you may say, well, I didn't have that experience. Neither did I. Different people are different. But that happened to be the thing with my sister Bonnie being in touch with the Holy Spirit of God that God used to where my nephew Steve saw that he needed to ask Jesus into his heart and open his heart's door to the Lord. And he got down and prayed and asked the Lord to come into his heart and save him from Revelation 3.20. Just a piece of paper 
that my high school sister, two and a half years older than I am, tore out of a piece of paper and a tore a little door in the heart. And he said, I get it, Aunt Bonnie, I get it. And he came to Christ as his Savior. I want to point out, if I may, that she used the Scripture. And she prayed. Very important. And I want to point out this, that as I said a minute ago, the most important part of our talking to anybody is the Scripture that we're going to use. And um, this illustration I got from C.S. Lovett also. He said a lot of people w uh, waste their time. Was a, I'm, I'm not prepared to go with that exactly, but he said a lot of people spend their time defending the Word of God. He said you don't have to defend the Word of God. Just use it. Now think about that for a minute. If it's God's Word, use it. The Holy Spirit of God will take care of the other end of the thing. And he used the illustration of somebody having their house broken into and the guy in the house having a weapon. And he said, if you've got a weapon in your house and somebody breaks in your house and you get your weapon out and point it at the guy, you're not going to spend your time telling him, now this thing works. You're not going to spend your time saying, you see, see how these bullets go in here? And, and, and do you see, it comes out here when I, when I pull this trigger. He says, you're, you're not going to spend your time. He said, you're just going to use it. Now, while I don't advocate you get too trigger happy, I want to say this. We can learn a lesson from that. Use it, brothers and sisters. Use it. It's the Word of God. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Use it. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing further than an M16 or whatever they call them. I don't know. Listen. Use it. But if you're going to use it, you're going to have to know how to use it. You're going to have to have it in your mind and in your heart. So I encourage you, memorize these verses of Scripture, and then next week we'll get into some other things likewise about some specific areas that we need to consider as we think of leading different people to Christ. And the first one will be with a section of Scriptures dealing with establishing sin or establishing the person is a sinner. We'll talk about that next Wednesday night. Close the lesson there for this evening. Do you have prayer requests you'd like to make before we go to the Lord in prayer? If so.